No clap? Aww. <laughs> um, okay, so a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Julie Ng. I'm actually an American, uh, but I've been living in Munich, Germany since 2007. So apologies in advance if I say really weird things in English, because I don't speak English on a daily basis. Um, I started uh, my sort of career, or just my working career, um, uh, at Ancestry.com as a designer. And I eventually got a chance to do a lot of their emails, which is sort of how I got into this topic. It was something that nobody else wanted to do, but also more importantly, uh, it was something in a giant sort of internet system that you can have really quick control over. You send emails regularly, so if you want something done, you can just basically do it and send it. You can do tests, you can learn really quickly. Whereas if you want to change something on the website and you're part of the tiny team in Germany, good luck. Um, a little bit more about me, I don't do, so I'm no longer salaried. I've been self-employed as freelancer for a couple of years now. Um, I occasionally do email stuff, but I mostly work as a contractor. Um, and also very important for me personally, uh, I'm a runner and I climb. So I used to be more active online, and if you follow Twitter, I'm really sorry, I don't tweet anymore, more or less, because, yeah, I'm outside. <laughs> um, I also uh, run the Refresh Munich community in, uh, in Munich. A uh, bunch of us met at various conferences, and we decided, why isn't there anything cool like that in Munich? Because although I'm an American and I could go to New York or San Francisco, I don't like those places. I actually like Munich or Zurich, but trying to get a visa for Switzerland is probably even harder than uh, Germany. OK, enough about me. Oh, very last thing. Uh, I created a template called Antwort, uh, which I did while I was a freelancer for a local company in Munich. And that's probably, in terms of the email realm, what I'm most known for, even though I haven't updated it in a year. And I've been planning to, and planning to, and planning to. And I want to do it before the talk, but I didn't manage it. So oh well. Um, let's talk about email. Uh, it's probably something that's um, not particularly sort of like interesting for you guys, right? You think of it's like work, right? Email, it's broken, it's spam, it's like mailing list, it's like read later, read later. Uh, you think of it as a task, inbox zero, as a goal. Um, and it's definitely sort of like not sexy. But really, we can also call email the beautiful cockroach of a social network, right? So this is a quote from... Uh, an article in The Atlantic, and I really, really like it. Uh, because it's a cockroach in the sense that it's a pain, but cockroaches, they could survive a nuclear war. And if you think about it, email has survived everything, right? So people, we have different means of communication, but WhatsApp got bought by Facebook, and everybody's like, ah, we got to go somewhere else. I think Three is made by a Swiss company, is that true? Uh, so we can't all just continuously flee something, right? So what's left over is email. Um, it's also beautiful because actually it's one of the very few things on the web that's entirely open. It's interoperable. It's not, it has, you know, standards. They're really, really old, but they still sort of work. And although email has served other purposes, uh, like, you know, newsletters and whatnot, we now have RSS feeds. We do use it for work, but now we also have various tools, uh, you know, be it a scrum board. So you have like whatever Trello, you have Slack and all those other things. You have various different services, but email is still there. It's not going to go away. Um, I also want to convince you that email is really, really important. And there's a lot of stuff to read on this slide, but don't. Or if you do, read 2, 4, or 16. And basically, what it's saying is that email is actually much more effective than social media. What's effective? Effective is, generally speaking, conversion or sales. And working at you know, large companies, be it as a contractor or even as a salaried employee, Twitter and Facebook is all hype. But in terms of the amount of money that you spend, like, it generates so much more money. I can't say numbers, but email is so much more effective than social media. Like, really, social media, you have to be there because if somebody's online complaining about you, you want to be able to respond to it. So it's really more about, you know, your brand, you're taking care of, of your appearance, but you're not necessarily sort of accomplishing conversion, sales, or whatnot. Um, I also want to convince you that you secretly love email. So I like this icon. I didn't make it. But it has a nice little heart, and there's an email message. Um, so not every email is bad, and sort of even bad emails are actually quite good, right? So the bad emails, the ones that you're thinking about spam, like buy this, do this, do that. We also have really boring emails, like this, that are really ugly. But you know what? I really, really love this email. Because I get it basically every month, 
and it warns me, okay, this, I don't know if this is my phone bill or whatever, it's one of those bills, and I just need to look at the month and sort of how much is on there. All right, it's 40, 50 euros, it's fine. If it's 100, I might freak out, but basically it's just, okay, it's there, and then you file it away. Uh, what's really good about this email as well is that there's a PDF attached, so I can send that off to my accountant. Um, it's really ugly, but I just need those three things, and it's done. And you think, like, who cares? Ah, ha, ha. Do you remember Heartbleed? Everybody had to go and log in and all these awful websites. What was your password? The website's broken. Trying to log into T-Mobile or Telecom to download an invoice? Forget it, right? So what I do, and what most of you probably do as well, is just set up all these automatic emails. Your email is generally secure. Hopefully your password is not Homer Simpson or password. Um, and everything just sort of comes in through there. So it's part of like your routine, you check it. You don't think about it, but actually you're really, really glad that uh, you have it. Um, before I continue, I want to ask, because I do do some design stuff, I do do some development stuff, sort of what my type of audience is. And because it's after lunch, and because I really love the fact that in Germany, instead of clapping after a lecture, you do this. Instead of asking you to, okay, who's a designer or who's interested in design, you're raising your hand, just sort of knock. Not like intense, but just sort of knock. And I just want to know, what are you guys more interested in? Sort of more design stuff or more development stuff, okay? Let's try that, and we'll see if we can make it loud enough so the guys downstairs can hear. No, I'm kidding. Um, who's interested in design or what's your interest in design? Oh, not so much. Development? Yeah, okay. So I'll try to go a little bit faster so we can go to live coding and then I can look like an idiot. Um, so one of the points that I want to make is that email done right is really, really nice. So this is me really, really happy snowboarding in Japan because the winter was crap in Munich. And so, yeah, why not? Let's go to Japan and snowboard there instead. And the other point I'll make is that it's teamwork. So how did this start? Actually, exactly one year ago, I gave a lightning talk, and I actually talked about Lufthansa emails and the fact that I wanted to go to Japan. Uh, technically, my sister also lives in Japan. So uh, I also fly Lufthansa regularly, so I get their newsletter, and I got this newsletter literally about August, or I don't know what the date there says, but a long time ago. And um, it said there's an offer for 750 euros, and knowing that they're usually about 1,000, I was really, really happy to have find something for 750. So my journey basically started with, oh, it's too small on my screen. So my journey basically started with this sort of newsletter offer, right? A couple of days later, I'm like, yes, this is what I want to do. Talk to my sister, get the dates, talk to a friend, and then I book the flight, which is on their website. After I book the flight, I get an email confirmation. That's really, really important, and you don't want to send it an hour later, a day later, three days later, like Air France. You want to send it immediately. I bought the email, I mean, I bought the ticket, I'm flying. You know, you don't know, like, you just, are they gonna charge you a credit card? Um, immediate is also good for business flights because you want to immediately forward that to accounting to get your 1,000 euros back. Uh, what's also really clever um, that belongs to the experience as well is that Lufthansa automatically sends you calendar events, right? And two events, you have the um, outbound flight and then you have the inbound flight. Um, Google or Gmail is also really clever and they pick up on that and they put in this sort of nice tabs. So you have these ICS uh, files, which unless I open in my calendar app, I can't really see, but in Gmail, oh, okay, it's right there. I got it, it looks right. <clears throat> so several months later, um, I get something called a trip reminder. So it's like, hey, in case you forgot, no, not really, you definitely remember, but they give you like really important information as well, right? So I got the weather, uh, which I guess was rainy at that time, and I think there was also a currency, and what else? I can't see from here. Oh, that was really important. The uh, Lufthansa office information or telephone numbers for Germany and Japan, right? That's really, really key. What if you arrive and something messed up, right? You don't want to call some international hotline, your local. What are my two local numbers? Germany and Japan. So this is like a really, really, really smart email. And the screenshot that I pulled is actually from the mobile version, but we'll look at the whole thing in a little bit. And of course, there's a couple more emails. There's a check-in reminder. Hey, Julie, you can check in now. Get the best seat that you can. And then after that, you also get the boarding pass confirmation. So if you think about it, it's a very sort of simple thing. I'm going on holiday. I'm booking a flight, and I'm flying. But it's actually a lot of emails right, in this one sort of process. And if we look at a chart, um, the source of this chart is Mailjet. And they're sort of like an email, some sort of service provider. Sorry, Mailjet. Um, you can see that we can actually put all these emails into sort of a category. 
most of us think of marketing emails, news newsletters, and special offers. Um, but for those of you who are interested in user experience and also those of you who are coders, the really fun stuff, the really interesting stuff, in my opinion, are notification emails and transactional emails. Because that's when you really sort of like accompany a user on a journey and make sure everything is done right. And you don't have to basically get your user to log on to your website, right? You're just talking to them on their phone or on their desktop as they're checking their email. Um, I sometimes consider notification and transactional emails as a single sort of category because they're automated. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that uh, here you'll see that you can't unsubscribe from certain emails. And so that's why I left the chart sort of more or less as it is. So in my uh, previous slide, I said good email is great, uh, but also it takes a lot of teamwork. And uh, with marketing emails, I like to think that we don't like them because really it's just one person sitting there, usually a marketing manager, whose goal is just to sell stuff. And that's, all the, that's the only person involved. They're just sending stuff. Whereas if you design a proper journey, kind of like the example that I just showed you, you need lots and lots of people involved, right? So you do need the marketing manager. It did start with the newsletter, right? So I don't want to say all marketing people are, are silly, because I used to be one as well. Um, you need a UX designer. And really, UX designer just designed the whole experience, the various different steps. You still need sort of the visual designer to design the newsletter. If you notice the Lufthansa newsletter and all their different emails, the branding is still there, very important. You need the front end person who does all the coding. And you will also need a back end architect to make sure everything runs smoothly. Um, basically, like when you're sending automated emails, you can probably be, some people probably send millions of emails a second. And making sure that goes well, right, without spam, really crazy stuff. I could talk about it, but I'm not going to because I'm going to run out of time. OK. So uh, I'm going to do an exercise. And so as I just did with the Lufthansa email, uh, what about a simple sort of invoice? Let's imagine that you have a subscription to a service, kind of like my T-Mobile email. Uh, what kind of emails would you have around that? Shout out an answer. I'll repeat it so that's on the mic. Seriously? Nobody? Come on. You have the invoice itself. That's essential email. Yes? Yes, you renew a subscription if it's not sort of automatically renewed. renewed. Cancellation, if I guess if I canceled it. Anything else? Sorry? Payment reminders, yes. OK, so I'm just going to skip so I can do some more coding. Um, uh, an invoice is not just an invoice. So I have here sort of like five sort of example emails, right? So really, you want to do reminders. Somebody mentioned like, hey, there's a charge coming up, especially if you have an annual service, right? Or something that's billed annually as opposed to monthly. Uh, what's also really important, which a lot of people forget, is credit card expiration date reminders. A lot of people will get really, really pissed off. Like, say it's a domain name, and it's not renewed because your credit card expired. But it happens once a year. Like, who knows? Like, and that you'll see on Twitter and other things. A lot of people, even like really famous people, people who are on top of things like Patrick McKenzie, if you know him, uh, get screwed over because the credit card expired, and nobody reminded him. And it's like a totally innocent mistake. And I think it's bad on uh, our part if we don't help users with that. Uh, so again, I have confirmation, possibly of billing errors as well. And so you want to keep all that sort of in mind as you design this sort of experience. It's in your benefit to make sure it works because you want their money. But you also want to make it like a nice feeling. It's not just, ha, I got your money. It's sort of like, hey, you, know, you want to do this. You can also cleverly like, remind people uh, when you say renewal, like check out all this new stuff that we've added. Right, as well. So give me your more money, and this is the new benefits that you're getting. OK, so let's do some quick examples in the browser. And then I'm going to totally get lost uh, as I switch from Keynote, because I am not a professional presenter. I'm already lost. Um, oh, that's my main display. Can I go to Windows? Mirror? Why is it not? So there are various different types of email. Uh, here's one from Jawbone, for example. So it looks kind of like this. It's a weekly reminder of what I've done, if I've been sleeping well, if I've been moving, and whatnot. Um, they're a really good company, but you know what? They haven't managed to do their sort of mobile emails. And this is just basically forced, squished, um, I think, on an iPhone. Uh, 
so we call it sort of scale, scale, scalable. It's not, some emails will still be giant and you don't have, you don't have to, um, you have to sort of scroll around. Here you can at least see all the content. It's just squished to 100% width. Not ideal, but it's something that happens. Another example here is Heroku. You can see all my charges. Uh, so here is the Heroku invoice. It's really nice, really simple. I see the month. Uh, but this one's more fluid, right? Because I have it in mobile, and it's still very, it's actually even nicer to read to a certain extent, right? Everything pops out, and then you have the stuff here at the bottom as well. Uh, now we're going to go look at my favorite email. This is the uh, Lufthansa email that I got, right? So I got the booking code. I got this is when you're traveling. This is when you're getting back. Notice what the table looks like over here. They're actually going to do responsive layout and change things, which is really impressive. Um, same thing with here. Notice the layout here. I have the hours in one sort of row, uh, or one sort of three call span row thingy. And then I have three columns for the weather. And I've got the two sort of phone numbers here. And being a giant corporation, they've got this sort of big uh, footer. But if I look at it on a mobile, uh, it's still really nice, really well done. I've got my booking code. Um, this table fit really well. And also, the economy previously was its own column. They've squished it into here, which is pretty, if you're into email, like, damn, blows my mind. Um, continue going down, and you see that, OK, this is still sort of its own row. The weather columns have also moved over. And this is really responsive as we know it, right? The layout has changed. So this is like the really, really advanced type email. OK, now I'm going to try to go back to the presentation and fail again. Yay. Wait, no, because now I don't have my notes. Uh, let's see. OK, perfect. So again, just to summarize, uh, scalable is just sort of the default scaling from the email client. But sometimes if you do it really badly, you have a lot of crazy widths, um, the client won't be able to scale it down for you. So you have this giant email, and you're kind of just doing this with your finger on the phone to see stuff. Uh, Fluid is really nice. If, if it's, especially if the email is simpler, you can just sort of make it sort of fit nicely so that you don't have to scroll horizontally, just sort of vertically. And responsive is sort of the crazy stuff. All right, so this is really hard. So, you know, we've got lots of tools to help us. Um, just to go over a couple before we do live coding, it's coming up, don't worry. Uh, if you don't know this, this chart from campaign, campaign Monitor is awesome. It literally shows you what works and what doesn't work. And the screenshot will also show you uh, there's for partial support which tags and properties are specifically supported for that uh, outlook. Uh, Litmus is a must if you do emails. Uh, it's basically testing across uh, various email clients. So you got uh, you know your PC and Mac covered, but you also have your Explorer, Firefox, and Chrome covered on a PC for the Yahoo email client. Uh, sometimes you just need to take um, you just need to make sure that you've got all your bases covered, so to speak. When you're coding emails, uh, one of the things that you have to do is you have to inline your CSS, and there's various tools to do that. Um, you can use something in the browser, like this example here from MailChimp. You can also use something that's plugged into your workflow as well, so you don't have to think about it. Um, there are also other things like buttons. You can do buttons in email, but it's a shit ton of code, because you can see like in Campaign Monitor. Uh, so you, they have tools to generate that for you, or I'll, I'll also show you uh, what I do. Uh, I think Ink is now the most popular email thing on, as a GitHub repo. Um, so they call it basically, I think, a framework for email. Um, you can do kind of like what you're used to with web design with sort of columns and flexibility. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of it. Uh, if you look at the examples that they show, so on the right side, they're very sort of simple, right? You have 100% columns or you have just sort of 50-50. I don't see the point of needing this to be able to accomplish that. And also with responsive, if you look at fluid grids, the numbers are crazy complicated. Whereas like here, 6 divided by 12 is 50. 8 divided by 12 is 66 and 2 thirds. So I don't use that. Um, another reason why you shouldn't use frameworks in general, and I don't mean to pick on them, is also just like code size. Uh, some emails are really, really long, and they'll get cut off. So you've probably seen this image before on Gmail where the message is clipped. You don't want that. 
Uh, if you want to look at layout possibilities, you might want to check out responsiveemailpatterns.com uh, by Brian Graves. And so he has lots and lots of different examples, and he'll show you the desktop and the mobile version. And what's nice is he has the CSS code at the bottom um, just relevant for that transformation. So you really can just sort of learn how that works. OK, now you get to see me make a fool of myself. I always like make fun of people, or I give people a hard time if they do a bad job with live coding because it's really hard, and I can't even get my mouse on the right screen. But I'm going to give it a try, because I think with email, you have to do it that way. So that we don't need anymore. Um, so this is what we're going to look at. Um, so this is actually something I did yesterday on the four-hour train ride over here from Munich. Um, I can't, I've done some cool stuff, but I can't show it because it's client work. So I decided to make something really quickly. Um, has like some sort of banners, maybe two articles. And then I decided kind of taking my inspiration from the Lufthansa email just to do something in the footer to be able to show you how to do transformations. Uh, so this is a fairly sort of normal looking uh, page. If we look at it over here, although we don't have the source, so you don't see it. Here, my CSS is actually not quite in line. You see that part of it already is. Uh, it's because I'm using a template. Um, but it's not quite there. OK. Oh, why is this not open? So because I do this regularly, um, I have my own sort of workflow. Workflow is much more important than templating, uh, because there's so many different steps for building an email. So the final one that actually, if I screw up, it's already done, um, looks like this, right? There's all this junk in here, which is really, really hard to sort of debug. Uh, so I work with something that looks more like this. Uh, it's still very readable. Every now and then, I have some classes. Or I haven't stuck that many in there yet. But I have some classes. Um, I also have my normal CSS here. Um, so I, because I'm lazy, I do something called pad sides. And I have my 14 pixels. I like SAS, but you can use less, whatever, if you build your own workflow. And this allows me to sort of add the styles that are then later automatically inlined. Um, so I actually have a server running, so I can sort of view the email. It's not inlined yet. Um, but if I wanted to, so I usually do, if I can type. And then it'll do a build for me. This is really important because you're constantly building emails and then sending them. Um, and then when you're running them in, uh, in Litmus, the usual response is, OK, seven minutes. If you're doing it in the evening when the East Coast or the US has woken up, it might be 15. But you're constantly sort of sending things. So it's really important to optimize your workflow. All right, um, am I on the right branch? Yes. So this is the no answer branch yet. Um, we don't really need this bit here, but it's like easiest in terms of doing responsive. As you can see, I have here somewhere 600 uh, wide email. It doesn't do the sort of scalability thing, right? Um, if we go back into here, here we have 600 pixels wide. We also have a class of container. Um, I have a main CSS, which is sort of loaded in development as a, a link style sheet. But I also have here a responsive CSS. Uh, Demo responsive. Um, OK, so the comment's wrong. It's, it shouldn't be uh, SAS. It's just normal CSS. Uh, what's really important to keep in mind, and I do this sometimes as well, I'm so used to writing SAS that here you cannot write SAS. Uh, there's another thing that's even more important, and that's here is uh, the table has a class of container, right? So normally we would write container. And then we'd write our um, styles. Here, I would do with 100% important. I also do max width 100% also important. Is that right? Oh, I forgot that. OK. Um, so linting doesn't like that. We need important, however, uh, because our styles will ultimately be inlined. So these styles in the head need to override that. So you generally almost always need important. Um, What's also not so cool is that this uh, will not work in Yahoo. Yahoo, for whatever reason, uh, will, in the web browser, 
will take all of this and apply it. They don't care that's in a media query. Uh, and so the trick to get around that is to do um, class equals container. All right. Oops. Table. Table. There we go. Um, I usually just add the table because then the linting looks sort of like nicer. You could theoretically do that as well and it would work. Um, but you basically have to get used to writing all your responsive styles like this. So we have this one. I'll refresh. And now it's doing that. Why does it look so big? I don't know. But now we have sort of like your, your middle of the way, your sort of fluid email. It's still not so ideal. We've got way too much text, as you can see uh, below the headlines. And you can see our crazy footer gets like really not so cool. Okay. So how do we fix that? If we go and look at our footer, um, how does this work? Oh, I should probably show you the data as well, data demo. OK. So um, this is how I usually build emails, because I usually build sort of more automatic, uh, auto-generated emails, and there's sort of data behind it. Um, it's also nicer to do it this way because you have a lot less code to look at. So I'm building the footer. I've got sort of three sort of columns with some items on it, uh, which is sort of built down here. So for each column, is basically a table, table cell, right? And I have 20%. There's three of them, so 20 times 3 is 60, and then I have left over the 40% here for the address. And did I call it something? No. OK. So what I have to do here is I'm going to call it a footer column. And then in my responsive, I'm just going to say display block, important. I'm also going to have with 100% um, important. If I refresh, ah, I forgot one. Going down here, I also want this 40% to be 100%, so I'm going to add that one as well. If we get that, they all sort of scroll down. So we're getting closer. As you can see, everything's squished up, which is not so nice. So I'm going to add some padding. And I'm going to add some more padding on the bottom. If you remember, these are individual table cells. So why is the linting? If you see a mistake, shout and let me know. Uh, so now we have it looking a bit more nicer. There's another bit up here as well, which I can also throw some padding at. Uh, ah, that's even better, actually. As you can see, I have a table here, but it's actually within this container, right? So instead of sticking the padding over there, why not just do table class equals footer? Oh, it didn't work. Ah, because it's not a table. It's a TD. Yay! So now I have sort of my responsive footer. Just, ah, even better, Julie. How come nobody told me you forgot the media query? Dumbass. <laughs> OK. There we go. So I get below 600, and then it squishes. So that's our first step to making the email responsive. You could basically use this technique, right? You take a table cell, you just make it a block, and it would work across the board, you think. And actually, until recently, you could. However, uh, this is what it looks like in the noise, uh, the noise, the newest Android. Litmus actually only has um, Android 4.2, starting with Android 4.3 and up you cannot change the display value of a table cell. So this is actually what you end up happening, uh, having over here, which looks really, really awful. But we want it to look like this, right? So we have to think of another way to do it. OK, this is where I'm really going to screw up, so bear with me. Um, if we look at what, we're, what we have here, most important bit is this bit here in the middle. The reason why we have these tables is actually mostly for Outlook. 
If we don't have these tables, Outlook will not know how to render columns. Um, it's also the reason why we have problems with, um, with Android. The solution is if we imagine that we don't have that Outlook table, I'm just going to ignore it for now. We make another table just for, and I'm actually going to take out the list because this is how you know that somebody coded it who normally codes web pages and, uh, and not emails. And what I'm going to do is um, here, I'm also going to have my 20% because this is what I have here in the table cell. I'm going to need another class so that I can target it for uh, responsiveness. I'm going to call it footer table. I'm going to be totally confused in a bit, but whatever. Um, too many various footer classes. Uh, yes. I'm a little neurotic about my sort of like wrapping because otherwise I can't see it. Um, the reason why I was a little confused is I have another sort of loop here and this is for the individual links for that particular column. So what I should have now is I should generate a table within uh, each TD. So then theoretically, I don't need the TDs anymore. So how do I get rid of them? I only need them for um, Office. So, and I always screw up the syntax, I'm gonna cheat. Uh, so what I end up doing is this. <laughs> okay. What's really important to understand is um, you've seen this before when you do, you know, for your conditionals for browsers. MSO just means Microsoft Office. Um, Microsoft Office is the rendering engine for emails, I think, or Office 2007 and up. And what we're going to do is we're going to take these tags and basically just wrap our particular table. Uh, so, this one needs to close here. Yes, this is going to be fun. Um, so, since I hate typing, so I'm going to do funky copy and paste. So, this TD tag I also don't need. Uh, and if, and if, this TD tag I will also not need. And if. this one as well. Now if I've actually properly done my indenting and whatnot, this should still sort of work. Why did it change? Uh, <laughs> ah, that's why. A line equals left. Yay. Um, I forgot to put a table here as well. So this one, if we remember, is 40%. So we should get that. So I'm going to ignore the fact that the padding is not sort of ideal. Um, as you can see, nobody's telling me. I forgot a line break here. So instead of the, using the UL and the ULI um, tags, I just do this, which is much simpler, much nicer. Uh, to transform it, what I'm going to do is I have here a footer table, right? Um, so I go back to my responsive style sheet um, and just do this. Ta-da! It's working. We're still missing all the crazy padding and whatnot. Um, but uh, in, sort of in principle, that's how you get it working. Um, OK. How are we doing on time? OK, I think I'm going to stop. I'll show the demo what it looks like. Uh, but then I'm going to stop so that you guys can ask questions. Um, so this is the final one. So I did do some padding. Um, what I've also done as well is I've hidden the text. Um, I changed the links to buttons to make it uh, also just sort of bigger. On the phone, uh, you want, Apple says, what, 44 pixels by 44 pixels minimum. So you want to make giant fat buttons so that you can actually tap them. Uh, but yeah, so this is my quick and dirty sort of demo. Uh, yeah, questions? I'm done. I'm going to say I'm done. No questions, and I can leave and go home.
Yes. Vitaly, of course. <laughs> Um, thanks, Julie. So what happens if you want to kind of reorder some of the blocks? So what happens if you have, let's say, three columns layout and the call to action button is on the right upper corner? And then when you stack it all, you have like one, the second goes under the first one, the third goes under the second one. So how do you reorder the stuff specifically on mobile without actually touching the markup? Yeah, you, you will have to touch the markup. Um, so say we have here, for example, I have here the address, right? We know from HTML that theoretically I could have this here in the markup before these three columns, but I could have just a float right, so you could do a table align right and it would be on the right hand side. Um, the problem is that you can't use techniques like that anymore if you need to address the newest Android, the newest Android 4.3, which is what I showed you. So for one sort of big client recently, we did this really crazy product newsletter with all dynamic data, six columns of products, because they have a small product that went to four columns, to three columns, we had to throw it all out the window because they said, no, 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 we've got lots of uh, uh, Android users, and they've got the newest Android, and so we have to change it. Um, I think that you have to sort of make a compromise with the design, and that you're not moving stuff too much. Uh, if you really have to move stuff, what you do is you double it, right? You double, you have one on the left, and you have one on the right, and you show and hide as you need it. The thing you have to be careful about, if it's just a branding, you have a logo in a certain place, that's fine, but if you start doing that with dynamic data, that times 100, whatever, the email ends up getting uh, to be too big. And we're not talking about images uh, per se, you're also talking about the code size. So remember the slide that said, Gmail will cut you off at 20K of code, uh, which you think like, oh, that's not a lot, right? So if we look at uh, my thing, that's not a lot of code, but if you open up the build, there's a shit ton of code there. Um, and this is a very simple email. If we look at the Lufthansa email, you'll see lots and lots of code, so that's the sort of thing you have to be careful about. Um, uh, okay, I was thinking, is it actually possible to use Flexbox at all? I would not. I mean, because you know, the reason why I'm asking is that the support for Flexbox on mobile is wonderful. Yeah, but you're, you're talking about clients and not... Um... Yeah, I'm, talk I'm talking about actually adjusting things, like fixing things for mobile. Let's see. Flexbox is not even here. No, of course not. But I mean, yep. um, uh, so the point, no, the point I would is... Not use it. Like, <laughs> like, m no, the thing is that modern browsers on mobile, even Android 2.3, well, 2.3, yeah. But most mobile browsers have a decent support for Flexbox, and this is where you can actually reorder. But it's stuff not a, the problem is that it's not a browser, right? Especially with Android, it's an email client. Oh, right, yes. If you use the Gmail app, for example, it'll show something. It used to be the web view. It used to be a web view yeah. of what you saw. Yeah, this is why I'm asking, yes. Right, but it's, not, it's no longer that anymore. Gmail on 4.3, I have a phone with me and I'll show you. Gmail does some crazy shit with your email, and they make it, instead of scalable, they make it fluid for you. They change your code and you kind of don't know how it's done. Like, it, it used to be that email app and Gmail looked a lot nicer because they would just render the view way or the, your code and they would use the media queries. Now it's like doing some crazy shit. They're saying with table cells, no, we don't do display block. It's a display table cell. The Gmail app, they're like, we're gonna change your code and try to make it fit in the mobile thing. And s most of the time it sort of works. Like, we want to design with sort of the newest technologies, but what here you have to do is basically do bulletproofing. And uh, for most clients, Outlook is still really, really important. I mean, it really depends on your group and who's viewing your emails. Um, but I would just say you have to really know your markup, your HTML and how it works, and get it working across all the different devices. You eventually get used to it. Yeah. It works. But instead of you hogging all the questions, anybody else? Nobody. Yes, over there. Um, how do you test your email in the different clients? Um, I use Litmus, so um, what you can do here is, I have responsive, um, you can paste in the HTML and they'll do it. They do rev revisions for you so that you can go into somewhere and say this is Outlook 2002 and I can say it works and it'll actually keep that. Um, this is really important for me so that I know what the problem points are. Um, usually until the end, I don't do a lot of green marks. I do a lot of sort of red marks. Um, but I don't have this many devices. And so I always just run the code through Litmus, and it does uh, screenshots for me. Um, I have the problem devices, so Android and maybe one or two sort of Windows devices, so I have uh, the latest Office, so I can view that. But when I'm pretty sure the code is solid, I just do Litmus, Litmus, Litmus. And for some client projects, I'm like on version 25 
you think about version 25 times the maybe average 10 minutes it takes to render stuff, it takes a long damn time if you need to get it perfect. Uh, but that's basically how I do my testing. What I've done with my system is just to get the workflow. Like I know the various steps. The CSS needs to be inlined. Um, I need to write certain uh, styles a certain way like this. But it all comes together more or less the way it's supposed to. And then I do a build uh, on my system, and I just do copy and paste. Or I also have a task that does uh, send. And I think the cheap thing is it takes the latest build and it sends it to my QA Gmail that I use. So it really is about just optimizing, like for me, my workflow, because I do this sort of so much. But litmus testing is really key. It is really expensive. Um, email and Acid is cheaper, but I don't like their interface as much. So I pay for litmus. Yeah. There's a question back there. Or how are we, you're going to tell me if we need to stop, right, yeah, Angela? Okay. Oh, we'll perfect. Secretly, I just want to get off the stage. <laughs> what is your experience with spam detection? I saw that Litmus is also providing that. Litmus does provide that. Um, so recently, I've been working more as a contractor, so I haven't looked at actually spam so much. Uh, my experience with Ancestry, spam is really something for the back end guys. I mentioned briefly that you have to really set up some sophisticated architecture. Uh, so startups are new, like, okay, I can set up a throttling. I only send, you know, 10,000 emails every 10 minutes, and I'm good. No, it's not good. You've got to look at the geography, when those emails are going out. Uh, if you have lots of automated emails, it's really smart in your back end to also build, uh, per user, a max number of emails they can get in a certain period, like, for example, seven days. It might just be that you get screwed, that it's a renewal period, and you have a couple of marketing emails going out as well. And you need to be able to prioritize those emails. OK, sorry, marketing, but those uh, renewable, uh, those invoice reminders and whatever, those have to go out. The other ones don't. So it's really, if you're working with the internal sort of uh, company or sort of in-house, there's a lot, a lot of things to consider when it comes to spam. Uh, mostly how many emails the user is getting, when they're getting them, and how many you're sending out at a time. So I use uh, APIs to send uh, my stuff. Uh, I use Mandrill, which is just SMTP. But they take care of uh, everything for you. So if you wanted to pay for a dedicated IP, you can do that. And they'll just take care of uh, who's getting what email when and blah, blah, blah. I don't deal with it. Like, I'm not smart enough for that. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah, OK. It's another question up here. Also a question about spam. Is this the content of the content, how you code your emails and the tags you use? Do you have then some spam detectors in mind? I think spam detectors also look at the content of what's, what's inside the mail, if it's Viagra or not. But are there also some, uh, some tags you, you try to avoid? Uh, I think a good general rule of thumb is that if you have the uh, person's name, you should definitely include that. So you would say, hello, Julie. Uh, Service providers also look for an unsubscribe link. So if you don't have that, that's also an issue. Um, in terms of content, um, I think that's tough. I, I, I don't have so much experience with that, uh, to be honest. But you don't have a specific HTML tag in uh, mind? Like Coding? I don't think so. I mean, because if you think about it, most spam emails are text emails, right? If you want Viagra, I'm a Nigerian prince, and I need your help, they're all text. So I, w I would, my guess off the top of my head would be that the coding is less of an issue. And the thing is, you should really pay attention in terms of the coding if it's working, if it's, you can view it. And because it's so complicated, I figure, I think, its code is probably uh, good. It just has to sort of work. I don't know if they're thinking, looking at that. Sorry. Not so smart, Julie. Uh, any other questions? OK. Oh, no. I can't leave yet. <laughs> Um, could you say something about email tracking, how you handle this, or like how often it gets open, or is there something provided by services? Uh, so these are the things I sort of prepared, but I never actually ended up doing. <laughs> um, no, because the talk would have been too sort of like uh, long. There are a lot of things you want to do to tr uh, track of. You want to track clicks, you want to track opens, you want to track uniques. Uh, things like uniques, you kind of need a more sophisticated system to do that. I've uh, worked with or seen startups that just say, oh, we, we stick like by hand 
all our UTM Google Analytics tags and all our links, so it takes care of that. But it doesn't properly track uniques. It doesn't properly track if you forward it and whatnot. I don't know. I use a service, like again, I use Mandrill, which is from um, MailChimp, and I just use their SMTP server, and they throw in all their linking, uh, their tracking system um, into all my links, and it works. I mean, you basically have a lot of rerouting, right, if you have your own sort of uh, tracking system in as well. But I believe in more data necessarily than you actually need so that you can just later sort through it if you need to. Uh, with tracking, like this is where back end comes in as well. Like you don't want the marketing person to be responsible for it. Usually they forget it or they do it wrong. They don't set it up properly, uh, which is why it's really good if the system does it for you. So I think, does Mandrill do it? I don't know. Ancestry used a lot of uh, proprietary, like sort of really big business software. But they were really smart. They would be able to say, OK, how many people in total clicked on this link and went to this page? But they would also be able to show you on a heat map which link that they clicked to get there, right? Because you can click the image, you can click the headline, and maybe after the body text, you have a little uh, button as well. And that's also really important. Uh, if there's a button, most people click on the button, uh, from what I gather, uh, from my experience. And then sometimes they click on the images. But you want to track everything that you can. And that's why I use services that I don't have to think about it. Or they do everything without me doing much. Thank you very much, Julia. Yeah.